In the foreword to Amy Ramikas's book On Reckoning, she writes, to anyone who carries the cloak of trauma with them, we see you and we believe you. You didn't deserve any of it and you did not do anything wrong and you're not alone. It is a strange thing, is it not, that we must make such kind of statements to those who are survivors of family and domestic violence. Surely that should be our default position. Surely that should be our starting point. We have a problem with family and domestic and sexual violence in, Australia, in Western Australia. It is an issue throughout our state, in our cities, our suburbs and across our regional, rural and remote communities. It is little wonder that women right across the state and indeed the country are angry. We're angry, we're frustrated and we've had enough. As young Australian Brittany Higgins shared in the March for Justice, I watched as people hid behind throwaway phrases like due process and presumption of innocence, while failing to acknowledge how the justice system is notoriously stacked against the victims of sexual crimes. It is little wonder that women have had enough. It is little wonder that women are marching for justice. During that same speech, Higgins also noted, I am cognizant of the women who continue to live in silence. The question we must ask is why the silence? Why the invisibility? Why are women and children made to disappear into their trauma? Why does a young woman have to campaign to let her speak or to let them speak? Why are we silencing, gaslighting those who most need our help, support and our care? We have a crisis in this state and in this country that is aided and abetted by that silence, by our willingness, by our unwillingness to engage, to speak out, to make noise, to ask questions, to act on our suspicions. And we have a whole community responsibility to address that silence. Two thirds of assaults in WA were family and domestic violence related in 2021, with eight family and domestic violence homicides as of 7th of December last year. One in five Western Australian women report experiencing partner violence since the age of 15. Violence against women and children has been estimated to cost Australia $22 billion annually. Family and domestic violence is also the leading cause of homelessness for women and children. Aboriginal women and children experience family violence at a disproportionately high rate, with Aboriginal women 32 times more likely than non-Aboriginal women to be host hospitalised from family violence. The National Community Attitudes Towards Violence Against Women survey found that one in five Australians believe family and domestic violence is a normal reaction to stress and that sometimes a woman can make a man so angry that he can hit her without meaning to. One in three Australians believe that if a woman does not leave her abusive partner, then she is responsible for the ensuing violence. Two in five Australians would not know where to go to get outside help if experiencing domestic violence. We must ask ourselves, what have we consistently done wrong? And what is it that we continue to do wrong that is causing such horrifying statistics? But statistics aren't people. Statistics don't show us blood and bruises. They don't show us the pain and trauma and suffering of everyday people. It is significant that the McGowan government as part of its response, has appointed Western Australia's first dedicated Minister for Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. The McGowan government has taken unprecedented action to address this issue across the state, investing in an additional 126 million since coming into government. But we still have a long way to go. Whilst we've invested 60 million to boost and to help prevent family, domestic and violence, family and domestic violence. We have also launched the Path to Safety, Western Australia's safe strategy to reduce family and domestic violence 2020 to 2030. The McGowan government's new strategy to prevent family and domestic violence across Western Australia is a long-term vision where people can live free from domestic violence. It sets a clear whole of government community plan for reducing and responding to family and domestic violence over the next decade. 
It is investing $14.2 million in a law reform package, $7.3 million to boost prevention of family and domestic violence, and $4 million to be invested in supporting survivors' initiatives. This is a reflection of the groundswell of anger and an increasing demand for change. There has to be change because women are suffering, being harmed, survivors are self-harming and women are dying in this country that has been enabled by our inactions, our failure to see our personal responsibility to protect our women and children. It is well and truly time for us to take a deep, painful and uncomfortable look into our co collective socialisation and ask and answer the questions with brutal, unflinching honesty. Why? Why do these conditions remain and what can you do to help? Because while women stood outside the Australian Parliament, inside, the current Prime Minister of Australia said that they were lucky. Because in other countries, such protests would have been met with bullets. That is, met with violence. When the bar is so very low that women should be thankful that they're not being shot and killed for seeking their fundamental right to safety, it seems safe to say we have a serious problem. But in fact, it's not even safe to say that. Because when family and domestic violence and sexual violence are being addressed and discussed in the media, survivors are telling us that the incidence of them becoming at greater risk of harm increases. Perpetrators become angered and the likelihood of them experiencing greater suffering increases. After all, the place in which women and children are least safe is in their own home. And with the proliferation of technology, this has become even more so the case as victims find themselves monitored, manipulated and controlled in ways that are readily enabled by technology. And those who hold power use, are using tech media and the technology to serve their own nefarious ends. So to the Prime Minister, with all due respect, I will say women are being met with bullets, with violence, with abuse, with sexual assault, with coercive control. Women are dying. Women and children are being murdered, beaten, raped, groomed and assaulted every single day in this country. So don't you tell us we're lucky. Don't you tell us about your cosy, clarifying chats that you had in the comfort of your own home while women and children in this country continue to suffer at the hands of perpetrators. We have a culture that is seeped in the fettered stench of entitlement and proprietary rights. Violence, power and control place our community at risk every day. These rights, this entitlement to power and complete control over, over the lives of women and children is revealed in gut-wrenching detail in Jess Hill's See What You Made Me Do. It laid bare for all who could stand to watch it, the horrifying experience of women and children each and every day in this country. Embedded in the title of Hill's book and sub subsequent documentary series is the sinister victim blaming that underlies the problem, what you made me do. The insidious questioning and prevalent undermining of survivors is a significant and ongoing contributor to the problem. Ramikas in On Reckoning asks, ever noticed how you never hear the he, shed, he said, she said in any other crime? No one has ever characterised a burglary as they said, they said. The only time the discourse ever pits two stories against each other is when a woman raises an allegation against a man. National Community Attitudes Towards Violence Against Women Survey in 2000. 2017, found there was a declining understanding of what constitutes violence against women. Alarmingly, this is particularly the case in our 16 to 24 year age male age group. This tells us in no uncertain, uncertain terms that we are failing our young men. And then when as a result of our failings, our young men inevitably commit the crimes that we failed to teach them were wrong, what then? At what point do we accept our social and community responsibility to be part of the prevention of family, domestic violence and sexual assault? The McGowan government is working to address this. We have begun, and while it must be acknowledged there's still much to be done in primary prevention, some of the current initiatives include a 7.3 million boost to primary prevention of family and domestic violence. Primary prevention is expected to have the greatest long-term impact on reducing the rates of family and domestic violence. 
We are implementing the WA Respectful Relationships Teaching Support Program to teach students about positive and respectful relationships from a young age and prevent domestic violence before it starts. As a result of a, two thousand, the two, of a 2017 McGowan Government Election Commitment, the Respectful Relation Teaching Support Program was introduced at schools in 2019. In 2021, we committed to an additional 1.3 million to expand this program to 12 additional schools each year over the next four years, starting in July 2022. This will give a total of 128 schools the opportunity to participate. We will also expand the respectful relationship approaches to sport and recreational clubs. These are all appropriate steps to be taken to respond to the family and domestic violence crisis. We're responding to what the data and the research tells us. Notably, in legislative reform, one of the key changes is a new specific criminal offence for suffocation and strangulation, which is an important risk factor in the context of family violence. Research tells us that when a female victim, sorry, when a female has been victim of strangulation, she is seven times more likely to be the victim of homicide. Moreover, the McGowan government takes the issue of sexual harassment and assault extremely seriously. As a government, we're cognizant that women face an unacceptable and disproportionate risk of sexual violence. All women and girls deserve a life free from violence and assault. Protecting women and girls against violence, discrimination and harassment in their homes, in their workplaces, in their communities is a priority for the McGowan government. WA has one of the highest rates of sexual assault with the number of victims of sexual assault recorded in Western Australia increasing by 10% from 2019 to 2020, the highest it's been in 28 years. It is clear we have a crisis. Former Australian of the Year Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins, and of course the many revelations relating to the culture of our parliaments and those who serve within them, have drawn our attention to these significant problems. As current news makes us painfully aware, women and children from all walks of life are at risk. No one, it seems, is spared. Last year, the Minister for Women's Interests and the, the Attorney General and the Health Minister made a joint commitment to commission WA's first sexual violence prevention strategy. A whole of government approach is needed to address this devastating issue in our communities and to support the prevention of sexual violence. The strategy will be victim-centred and focus on making sure we have the right supports in place for victims, identify potential barriers to, to reporting and to hold perpetrators to account. While sexual violence impacts women in greater numbers and the overwhelming number of perpetrators are male, the strategy will adopt a broad lens and look at the impacts of sexual violence on boys, men and the LGBTQIA plus community. To complement the strategy, earlier this month, the Attorney General and the Minister for Women's Interest announced two major reviews to WA sexual assault laws. The state government recognises the need to improve our laws and processes to assist victims to get justice, and we are committed to making that happen. These reviews will be concurrent and complementary to examine issues relating to sexual offending. The Law Reform Commission of Western Australia has been tasked re with reviewing the sexual offence laws contained in the Criminal Code and providing advice on possible amendments to enhance and update these provisions. This will include considering whether the concept of affirmative consent should be reflected in the legislation, how mistakes and knowledge of consent should be dealt with under the law and the factors that might invalidate consent, such as coercion, fraud or deception for example, through stealthing and whether special verdicts should be used. These, the Department of Justice through the Office of the Commissioner for the Victims of Crimes will undertake a separate project examining the end-to-end -end criminal justice process for victims of sexual offending, from reporting an offence to the release from custody of the offender. Last year, the McGowan government also passed legislation to expand mandatory reporting requirements to ministers of religion, early childhood workers, 
out of home care workers, registered psychologists, school counsellors and youth justice workers. The Children and Community Services Amendment Act 2021 implements recommendations of the final report of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Safety of children is at the heart of the mandatory reporting reforms, which will better protect children by increasing the number of people who are legally required to report child sexual abuse by an estimated 55,000 reporters. The extension of mandatory reporting laws to ministers of religion and a number of other professions sends a clear message that child safety must always be paramount. Child sexual abuse reform advocates like Grace Tame congratulated the government on implementing these important reforms. And as Ms Tame noted, this is what understanding and progress looks like. I would also like to take this moment to recognise the establishment of the Grace Tame Foundation, a not-for-profit philanthropic organisation established by the 2021 Australian of the Year Grace Tame to campaign for and to help fund initiatives which work to prevent and respond to sexual abuse of children and others. This is particularly important because child sexual abuse, which is intrinsically linked to family and domestic violence, show statistics tell us that one in five children experience sexual abuse. The Grace Tame Foundation aims to ensure the Australian government and governments of states and territories take appropriate action by enacting laws, delivering education programs and encouraging social behaviours. It also promotes attitudes that fulfil obligations to ensure the rights of children to be safe no matter where they are, as per the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Finally, I would like to add my voice to the collective disgust that has been expressed towards those who would release that image of a young Grace Tame in an attempt to undermine her. As Ms Tame noticed, noted, trauma responses are many and varied. To quote Ms Tame, it can be ugly. It can look like drugs, like self-harm, skipping school, getting impulsive tattoos and all kinds of other unconscious, self-destructive, maladaptive coping mechanisms. Whilst I do not seek to glorify, sanitise or normalise any of these things, I do not seek to shame or judge survivors for any of their choices. I'd also like to add to that um, a recent story, uh, I guess the addition is that it can also look like suicide and I send my condolences to a recent uh, loss of a child sexual abuse survivor, a friend of mine who lost a family member to suicide as years of trauma um, just became too much for that young person. I commend Miss Tame for once again taking the opportunity to educate, even when she's being attacked in such a cruel and cowardly manner. Her strength in the face of such vile and cruel actions is both breathtaking and humbling. And so I end where I began, reading the words of Amy Ramikis. To anyone who carries the cloak of trauma with them, we see you and we believe you. You didn't deserve any of it and you didn't do anything wrong and you are not alone. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Nick Gorane. Mm. 